So this little video is about adaptations of different organisms and their nitrogenous waste. But first of all we're going to deal with why you would need nitrogenous waste. So the key point here is that uh, when you take in protein in the diet, you break it down into amino acids. And obviously we need the amino acids, and it's GCSE you said it all, we need them for growth. <coughs> By growth, really what we mean is making those cell components that are made out of proteins, like enzymes and hormones and your immunoglobulins. But there are always some left over in a high protein diet like we have in the, in the West. So our excess amino acids, the ones that we can't use to make up other proteins, uh, they can't be stored. So we need to deaminate them first. And the deamination reaction, um, just reminding you here of the structure of an amino acid, we've got an amino group, this variable R group, the acid group, and the hydrogen. So deamination really involves taking away the amino group and a hydrogen to make ammonia. It's not the right way around, it's not, is it? It is? Oh, right, okay. So, uh, what happens to the rest of that group here is that it's oxidized, it has more oxygen added to it, and this can then uh, head off and be used in respiration. So, this deamination, you need to know that term, means removal of ammonia, and then the rest of the molecule can then be respired. What happens to the ammonia then is it's converted and in mammals it's converted to urea which circulates from the liver round through the bloodstream and off to the kidney to uh, be cleared away from the blood. But that is not the only thing that could happen. So if we come to look at this huge but simple table, <coughs> we can see that we've got three different sorts of nitrogenous waste. We've got ammonia, we've got urea, which is what we make, so that's the one that you're most familiar with, and we've got uric acid, which is a more solid uh, compound. And they all have different properties, and it relates really then to the environment in which an organism lives. So, um, this is why it's in the adaptations bit. So we'll start off with sort of the easy thing. So if you are a fish, if you're something with a massive surface area to volume ratio, uh, which is then means that you're adapted to live in a damp environment or an aquatic environment so that you don't dry out, then actually running out of water to get rid of ammonia, which is very toxic, um, is, you know, the getting rid of your nitrogenous waste is the least of your worries if you run out of water, you're going to dehydrate and die. And if you're a fish, obviously, you're not going to be able to do any gas exchange and you're going to die. So actually, the, the, what fish and microbes, things with big surface area to volume ratios do, is they just don't use any energy at all. They make ammonia. Ammonia is highly toxic. But that's fine because it's also highly soluble, so all of the bits of them that are in contact with water, or their gas exchange surface, whether it's their cell surface membrane or the gills, um, will excrete that ammonia pretty rapidly into the water that surrounds them. So, great because you don't need any energy to make ammonia, it's just a deamination reaction, you can use the rest for respiration, big amount of solubility, dissolves straight into the water, um, which is good because you're getting rid of it because it's toxic. So that's the sort of simplest. In mammals, we're converting that really toxic ammonia from the deamination into urea. So that effectively, uh, you're taking the ammonia and you're adding carbon dioxide to it. So double whammy there, get rid of two nice excretory products. It does take a bit of energy, so you're using you know, an ATP to make that, so there is a little energy cost there. But the huge advantage for mammals is that it lowers the toxicity of the ammonia by converting it into urea, makes it less toxic. 
it's also really useful because it has a medium solubility, which means that it is very variably, uh, you, can, you can either get rid of it as a really concentrated solution, or you can get rid of it as quite a dilute solution, dependent on how much water you have available in your environment. So mammals actually have uh, different lengths of the loop of Henle, which is the bit that's going to cause the urine to concentrate, the first bit that's going to make it concentrate, dependent on their environment. So something like an otter or a beaver will have a very short loop of, of Henle. They're not building up a massive concentration difference in the medulla, but that's okay because they're living somewhere quite aquatic. Something like a dog, a cat, a human, where we have water quite readily available, will have a medium length loop of Henle and build up a medium concentration of salt in the medulla. So you're taking out a medium amount of water from the descending limb. And then of course we've got that ADH system that allows us to concentrate the urine down. If you live somewhere in a desert, like uh, the very famous kangaroo rat, much beloved of all biology teachers, they are quite cute, wouldn't make good pets, they'll stink. have a really long loop of Henley, and the kangaroo rat actually produces the most concentrated urine of any mammal. The advantage of having a really long loop is you can build up a massive salt concentration gradient in the medulla. And if you've got a massive salt concentration gradient, you can remove water all the way down the length of your loop and then more water again from your collecting duct because you've got such a huge concentration of salt. So if you're asked about this in an exam, you need to talk about the length of the loop, you need to talk about the environment in which the mammal lives, from sort of, you know, really near water to hardly any water, and you need to talk about that salt concentration gradient low gradient to high gradient. So that's pretty easy to remember. And again, don't keep a desert uh, kangaroo rat as a pet. Their urine is really, really concentrated and very, very smelly. So, camel's the same, obviously. Don't keep a camel as a pet. Uric acid. Now this is the one that you're probably least, well, yeah, least familiar with. So, the problem with um, perhaps wanting to be able to fly or lay an egg or, and living somewhere dry, so a terrestrial animal, is uh, that you might not want to be carrying round a bladder full of urine, water, you know, every litre of water weighs a kilogram. So um, if you're wanting to fly, you don't want to be carrying that round so that it can store your urea until you're ready to get rid of it. So you also want something that's not very toxic so that when your embryo is developing, it's not building up a big toxic compound inside of the egg. So further conversion to uric acid. Now this does require a lot more energy. So say we're using one to make urea, we might be using eight to make uric acid. So much bigger energy cost. So only done by organisms that really need to not be carrying around water or not be losing a great deal of water when they're trying to get rid of their nitrogenous waste. So advantages of uric acid, low toxicity, so if you're in an egg you can still make it and you can leave it behind when you exit the egg. Low solubility, now this means that you don't urinate as an organism, you produce a paste of uric acid, but fantastic because you don't need to carry around any water in order to get rid of it, or you don't need to lose water to get rid of it. So organisms that do uh, uric acid, reptiles, obviously, egg laying, quite often, you know, they're adapted to live, I know there are sea turtles, um, there's always the exception, but they're, they're adapted for terrestrial dry environments. Insects needing to do two things, lay eggs and the vast majority of them fly. And birds of course, again laying eggs 
and the whole uh, the whole bird, as you know from the studies last year, are adapted for flight. So you know those hollow light bones, air sacs in the lungs. So they're trying to be as light as possible. Last thing they want to do, carry around a bladder full of water to get rid of nitrogenous waste. And so they effectively produce uric acid, which they poo out over your car. Good idea to wash your car if it gets pooed on by a bird because of the acid thing going on. Okay, I think that's about it.